Hello, Sally and I welcome you to Streams of Living Water, flowing today from our home. Advent may be shorter this year than usual, and that's a problem. Today, we're going to find out why. My name is Pastor David Birkenall. My wife, Reverend Sally Welch, and I are co-producing these videos, Streams of Living Water, to provide a sense of connection and encouragement and an opportunity to reflect on what it means to be a Christian in our turbulent times. Streams of living water is used throughout the Bible as a metaphor for the Holy Spirit, transforming, challenging, calling, equipping, and sending us through turbulent times on the course that leads to receiving eternal life. We are retired clergy with over 80 years of ordained ministry experience between the two of us. I grew up in Wisconsin where it said there are four seasons, almost winter, winter, still winter, and road construction. Today, there are some who seem to feel the same way about Advent. Advent is the season of the church year of preparation for Christmas. Advent means coming. We celebrate both the first Advent of Jesus at his birth and prepare for the second Advent of Jesus to judge the world when everything will be made new in its perfection. For some, it's all too much. I often think at this time of the year about Pastor Inkfist, the pastor of Garrison Keillor's mythical Minnesota town, Lake Wobegon, who began an Advent sermon with a proposal something like, this Christmas I propose that we resist the temptation of our world to make Christmas about the things that we can buy. Let's make it less about the gifts and more about the gift God has given us in Jesus Christ. And just then his gaze fell to the front row in front of the pulpit where his five children were mouthing the words, no, dad, no, no. I get that children find that Advent is too long to wait. Advent begins four Sundays before Christmas. And for some grown-ups, that's too long to wait. Though I've seen some clergy online who inexplicably are arguing for a seven-week Advent season. This year, though, some churches will be cutting Advent to three Sundays instead of four. Why? Because this Sunday is the fourth Sunday of Advent. It's also Christmas Eve. Some churches are afraid that no one will show up in the morning, I guess. So they have canceled the morning Advent service and will only have a Christmas Eve service. And even if churches have an Advent service in the morning, I know that some people will feel that they have too much to do. So they will shorten Advent themselves by skipping it. Why is that a problem? First, because it brings into question what we value. We value rain, for example, and now we're getting some. Churches, however, have values that they express through their behavior. Christmas is a peak time for visitors, and they are less likely to hear about any changes in the regular worship times. When they arrive in the morning and find no worship service, or one that is greatly diminished in attendance, it creates an impression that worship times are flexible and for the convenience of the congregation's members. This year's dilemma is like the issue raised in the question, should I force my children to go to church? Some people answer, no. I was forced to go to church as a child and I hated it. I want my children to decide for themselves. It's not an uncommon, but it begs some questions. Like, do you force your child to eat nutritious meals? Do you force your children to go to school, to do their homework, or to get enough sleep? Children can tell the difference between what is important to their parents and what is not. Children learn some of their most important lessons by example. That's why it's not just important for children to go to church. It's important for them to worship with their parents. I don't think that parents should use threats or physical force, but instead communicate a common identity. It happens through parents who by their words and deeds say, we are a family and this is who we are. The whole church is the Christian community, but every congregation doesn't have to be a large community. I often think of the Anglican vicar who thought that what his congregation needed was a 6 a.m. service of prayer and Holy Communion. His friends were skeptical. Who's going to come out to church at 6 o'clock in the morning? A couple of months later, 
A few of them asked him how it was going. It's going great, the vicar said. Um, the surprised colleague asked, how many people come out at 6 o'clock a.m. for prayer and Holy Communion? He answered, well, me and my mother and the two maiden sisters who come to everything, and about a trillion seraphim, a quadrillion cherubim, and all the hosts of heaven. We are important and necessary to one another. We are a people set apart. We need one another to build one another up, to share one another's burdens, to share a common identity. And we are being rooted on by the heavenly host. This is who we are. Second, it removes an opportunity to hear a lesson about Christmas that many of us seem to have forgotten. One of the most popular contemporary Christian Christmas songs in the past several years has been one called Mary, Did You Know? I've sung it. I found it moving. Maybe you have too. But it's also nonsense, and those who miss worship this Sunday will miss an opportunity to reflect on why that is. Here's how the song starts. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? That the child that you delivered will soon deliver you? Here's the reading from the Gospel of Luke that will be read in the vast majority of Christian churches all over the world this coming Sunday, Luke 1, 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Yeah, Mary knew. The angel Gabriel told her. Hearing the lessons read out loud gives us information like this. The Bible is the primary way that God speaks to us, and we share it with millions of Christians all over the world, hearing the very same thing on the very same day in the church year. It also changes lives. Third, worshiping at the Sunday morning, fourth Sunday in Advent service helps us keep our focus on the blessing. We celebrate because we know who has come and who will come again. We celebrate the waiting in which God speaks at the first Advent and at the last. We celebrate to keep our focus on keeping awake. Our struggle is with this world's secular imitation of Christmas. Our struggle is with patience. Our struggle is an opportunity to practice patience as we wait for Jesus to come again. It's a chance to reject the temptation to cave into this world's winter shopping festival that began months ago. It's not a burden. It's a blessing. Worshiping in Advent on the fourth Sunday of Advent gives us the backstory to the backstory of Christmas. We will be prepared in the morning for what will be announced at night. I saw a meme in three parts the other day. The first showed Advent candles marked Advent. The second showed a manger scene marked Christmas Eve. And the third showed a guy yelling, well, that escalated quickly. Christmas Eve will remind us that God keeps his promises, even if it takes a very long time. 
But just as the law is needed for the gospel to make sense, and just as Good Friday is necessary for Easter to make sense, the fullness of Advent is necessary for the fullness of the Christ event to make sense in all of its meaning. Without it, we are like that woman who had come to the point in her life where her extended family had grown so large that buying Christmas presents for everyone was too much. She couldn't keep track of what everyone needed or wanted. So she wrote a stack of checks and filled out a pile of Christmas cards written to everyone with the message, this year you can buy your own Christmas present. She brought them to the family Christmas gathering and passed them around. Toward the end of the evening, she noticed that people were looking at her funny. Something wasn't quite right, but she couldn't put her finger on what it was until she got home and saw on her writing desk was a neat stack of checks, uninserted in the Christmas cards. All people received was a message that said, this year, buy your own Christmas present. <laughs> Something important had been left out. It will still be Advent this Sunday before sundown, both in the sense that it is Advent still remaining and that it is the Sabbath, a time to be still so that we can hear the message of the first coming of Jesus at Christmas and to contemplate his longed for second coming for judgment in the quiet. So don't sleep this Sunday morning, either physically or spiritually. Be awake and be blessed. Be ready, as Jesus called upon his disciples to do in Mark 13, 37. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake, because it's still Advent. Finally, we ask you to pray for peace in Ukraine and in Israel and throughout the world for the health of the church throughout the world, particularly among our brothers and sisters in Christ in Tanzania, for a complete end of the pandemic, for comfort, relief, and reconstruction for Turkey and Syria, for rebuilding in Haiti and Maui and Morocco and Libya, for those suffering as a result of the earthquakes in Afghanistan, and for all who are suffering as a result of the recent inclement weather. As always, we encourage you to stay hydrated with the streams of living water that is the Holy Spirit at work within and among us. Remember your church, care for others, take care of your mental health, and be kind to everyone. And now let us receive the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.